the writers of the New Testament employ a number of different figures of speech to describe the Christian life. Sometimes it is compared to warfare. Paul says we're to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ and that we're to put on the full armor of God. The role of a Christian is also portrayed as that of a servant. As you know, Paul himself often referred to himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And we should see ourselves in the very same way. Our Lord himself often used metaphors and similes to describe his followers. He said that we are to be salt and light. He said we're to be living stones with which he builds his church. But a favorite figure of speech for New Testament writers is that of the use of athletic terminology. Paul, for example, pointed to the sport of boxing and said, I box in such a way as not beating the air. In essence, Paul was saying that the Christian life is not mere shadow boxing, it is a real fight. But perhaps the favorite analogy of the New Testament writers is the picture of the Christian life as a race. And Paul used this analogy several times. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And here in Hebrews 12, we see the author of Hebrews describing the Christian life as a race as well. The theme of Hebrews 12 is endurance or perseverance. The Christians to whom this sermon was written were really suffering a lot of persecution. And so this chapter is given to urge them to endure it with faith. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 serves as the author's conclusion of chapter 11. The word therefore attaches this exhortation to the hall of faith. And you could say that the author has finished his argument from that chapter and now he's drawing his conclusion. Sometimes our chapter divisions are somewhat unfortunate, and that may be the case here. Because I think we would have to say that verses 12, uh, 1 and 2 of chapter 12 really is the pinnacle of chapter 11. And he's really saying, in light of all these great examples of faith, here is what we must do in response. But we also need to see that the author of Hebrews goes beyond that. We would have to say that this exhortation not only is a conclusion to chapter 11, but it is really a conclusion to everything that he has said in this epistle. And he's going to move now from the many examples of faith in chapter 11 to the one perfect example in chapter 12, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in essence, he is saying to them and to us, because we have a better revelation, because we have a better covenant, because we have a perfect once for all completed sacrifice, we must respond in faith and run the Christian life with endurance. But before we walk through this significant exhortation today, I want to say that this passage has sometimes been abused. I've heard many sermons on this text that take a modern understanding of a race and go beyond what was originally intended here. George Guthrie writes, we must not read anachronistically our modern cliches of a race back into this text. 
The goal of hermeneutics should always be to gain a clear understanding of the original author's original intent before we apply that truth to our lives. So we must not read something into the text that is not here. There have been a number of ways that preachers in our day and time have abused this. For example, some have compared this race as something in which we are in competition with one another. The analogy of the race in this passage is not intended to convey that idea. We're not competing with other Christians, trying to outdo one another in holy living and faithful service. That's not the idea. No, we are competing against, in this race, against the devil and his evil world system. We're also competing against our own sinfulness, but we're not competing against other Christians. Some have misrepresented this passage by communicating the idea that the race belongs to the strong. So the more disciplined you are and the more you work out and the stronger you get, the more likely you are to win the race. That's not it either. Of course, Christian discipline is very important, but that is not what this passage is teaching. Sometimes <clears throat> this is combined with the first one and preachers may say something like, well, you just need to break out of the pack and get ahead of the other runners, something along those lines. No, the concept that is being communicated here is the fact that every runner is intended to win. And everyone who endures will, in fact, win the race. Some have wrongly taught this passage as giving the idea that God promises to remove every obstacle in our way. I've heard it preached that way. This passage is not saying that either. Others have used this text to convey the idea that, you know, what's important is you really need to pace yourself. And the fact that the race is being described, that is being described here as a marathon and not a sprint has led some to the faulty application that if we pace ourselves, we'll get further. And the idea that is sometimes communicated is that you really should not hit the Christian life hard like a sprinter would, but you should live it in moderation and pace yourself and reserve your strength for the end and not put too much effort into it. Folks, that is absolutely foreign to what the Bible teaches. It is not what this passage of Scripture is teaching us. But some also go to the opposite extreme of that. They say that the Christian life really is all to be run in our own strength, that it's all uh, up to us and how disciplined we are as to how well we do with the race. That also misses the mark because we learn from Scripture that we must run the race in the strength of Christ. We don't do it on our own. He supplies the strength that we need as we run the race. So we need to be careful here about some of the abuses of these types of approaches to this text. But we can really get what the author is trying to communicate if we carefully analyze the grammatical structure of the text and use the terms that he employs. So let's move into it now, and we're going to take this in three main divisions. We're going to see the exhortation, the elements, and the example. Now, we'll also have a few subpoints thrown in there, but those are the, that's the main outline that we'll follow. Notice, first of all, the exhortation. 
The first thing that we need to note is that there is only one exhortation in these two verses. The exhortation is, let us run the race that is set before us. Let us run is the focal verb. Everything else consists of supporting participles and prepositional phrases. The author includes himself in this admonition. He also needs to run the race with endurance. So he includes himself. And I believe this is clearly here an exhortation to Christians. If you have never been born again through faith in Christ, you're not even in the race. But this is an admonition to Christians to run the race well. And notice the word race there. The Greek word is the word agon from which we get our English word agony. It refers to a contest or a struggle. Uh, Hobbes says it includes both peril and strain. In other words, the Christian life is not just fun and games. It's a struggle. It's a contest. It's a race, not a stroll. It's not a jog or a walk in the park. It certainly is not laying down for a long winter's nap. MacArthur says this race is not a thing of passive luxury, but is demanding, sometimes grueling and agonizing and requires our utmost in self-discipline, determination, and perseverance. He goes on to say, God's people are not called to lie around on beds of ease. We are to run a race that is strenuous and continuous. And again, we're not called on to do this in our own strength, but we're called on to run the race nonetheless. By the way, the Bible actually talks about four different postures as it describes the Christian life, four different postures. First, positionally, the Bible says we sit in the heavenly places. In Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, it says, when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where we sit positionally with Christ at the right hand of God. Secondly, the Christian life is described in terms of a walk. In Ephesians 4.1, it says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. This speaks of the manner of life that we as Christians are called to live. Thirdly, we're commanded to stand. Ephesians 6, 11 says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And this speaks of our posture against our enemy, the devil. We're not to give any ground to him, but to stand firm against his attacks by applying the full armor of God. And by the way, that's not something mystical there. It involves the basics of Christian commitment and the spiritual tools that God has provided for us to effectively stand against Satan. But the fourth posture that we see in Scripture is the one given in the analogy of the race. We are to run the Christian life. We're to run this race. And this speaks of our endurance by faith and our continuing commitment to Christ. So we see the exhortation. But secondly here, we see the elements. What are the qualifiers that give definition to what it means to run the Christian race. Our author gives three elements that may be understood as the manner in which we are to run the race well. 
First of all, he mentions the eyewitnesses, the eyewitnesses. Look again at verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, this, of course, refers back to all those examples of faith given in chapter 11. We're to run the race like they did, and we're to persevere like they did. And it is faith in God that will enable us to do that. This especially connects with those in the last part of the chapter who were being persecuted. We're to keep believing and keep trusting no matter what kind of obstacles that we might faith, face and what it might cost us to endure. Now, some people have portrayed this great cloud of witnesses as kind of like a heavenly stadium where all the saints of the past are all gathered in, you know, the stadium to watch us run. Folks, I don't believe that's what this means. These are witnesses in the sense of examples of faith that have run the race before us. The idea is not that they're watching us, so we'd better not disappoint them. No, we run for God, so we better not disappoint him. We don't run for the benefit of witnesses. They are examples, not onlookers. They have proven by their testimony and their witness that God is always faithful and we can always trust him. And they have shown us by their own lives that the life of faith is the only way to live if we want to please God. You know, at funerals, people are always talking about departed saints looking down at us. You've heard that, I'm sure. You attended any funeral. I don't find any real evidence of that in Scripture. Certainly, if this is the only proof text for that idea, it is not very sufficient for believing that. The point here is that we are not the first ones who have been tried and tested in regard to our faith. We're not the first ones to suffer persecution and hardship. There have been many others who have gone before us and have won the victory through faith. This is why they are eyewitnesses to us. We have the same God they did. We have the same promises from God they did. In fact, we really even have more because we have the revelation of the New Testament. And the point is that God has not changed and we can still fully trust him as they did and we can run the race well like they did. Bruce writes, it's not so much they who look at us as we who look to them for encouragement. And there's a play on words in the Greek language that connects this verse with chapter 11, verse 2. Essentially, God has borne witness to them that they are accepted by their faith and now they bear witness to us that this is the way that we are to run the race. The word for cloud is a common metaphor to designate a great throng of people. And by adding the phrase, such a great to it, this is drawing attention to the fact that there have been countless witnesses who have gone before us to declare to us, this is the way that we are to live. But there's another element that he points to here, and that is the elimination, the elimination. Before we run the race, there are some things we need to eliminate. There are some things that can hold us back and make it impossible to win the race. As with any good athlete, there are some things we have to say no to if we're going to expect to win the race. Verse 1 talks about 
some things we need to lay aside. These are obstacles that can prevent us from running well. And it's interesting, in Galatians 5, 7, Paul talks about some Christians who were running well, but then they began to falter. And he asked them, you were running well, what hindered you from obeying the truth? And so we see that running well and obeying the truth are synonyms. But scripture makes it clear that there are some things that will hinder us from running the race. The first injunction is the elimination of encumbrances. Encumbrances. Look at verse one again. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance. The word for encumbrance is the word ankas. It simply means extra weight or mass. It is not necessarily something sinful, but something extra that you don't need. There may not be anything in the rules that prohibit the wearing of an 80 pound pack on your back, but you're not likely to win the race if you do that. Or a runner could eat nothing but donuts leading up to the race, but he's not likely to win the race with that diet either. As I'm sure you know, world-class athletes always watch what they eat as part of their training. This is pointing to anything that weighs us down, anything that diverts our attention, saps our energy, or dampens our enthusiasm for the things of God. In the case of the original recipients of this letter, the author probably had in mind the legalistic trappings of Judaism. But for us, this could be any hobby or any kind of diversion or any kind of imbalanced priority that keeps us from being all that God wants us to be. Maybe you have your kids in so many activities, you don't have time for the church of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're so focused on making money and getting ahead in your career that you don't have anything left to invest in the eternal things of God. Maybe you're spending all your time playing video games and getting on Facebook and you don't have any time left to devote to ministering to people. Now, there are hundreds of ways that this might apply. The word every there implies this could be a number of things. And so we just have to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of ways in which we might need to address this in our own lives. But the question we need to ask is, if I am in a race and I am running to win, what kind of extra weight do I need to lay aside in order to win the race? What do I need to lay aside that's keeping me from being all God wants me to be? Many times we as Christians sacrifice the best for the good. We settle for things that are not necessarily bad, but they're not God's best. We need to get rid of some of that extra stuff. We need to remove some clutter from our lives. Ron Phillips says, it is possible to spend all our time in business, social, community, and personal activities that are good, but we forget the race. We forget we're in the race to win. We forget that we have to run in such a way that we will win. Our lives many times can become like that closet that you're afraid to open because you know when you do, everything's gonna spill out on the floor. Our lives get like that. So some of us need to get rid of some of that extra clutter. Some of us are not really even running the race because we have too much, too much extra weight in our lives. We couldn't even really say we're running the race. Then there's the 
elimination of entanglements. Verse 1 says, and the sin which so easily entangles us. Of course, it should go without saying that we as Christians should want to eliminate any sin from our lives that we're aware of. But it's interesting that here it says that sin easily entangles us. It trips us up. The word for entangles is a word that can refer to a vine or a rope that gets wrapped around the legs of the runner and prevents him from running. And the reference to sin here probably would apply to any sin. The definite article is used here, but it probably means any sin that wraps you up and entangles you. Most Christians have one particular sin that tends to trip them up. And it is this sin in particular that we need to jettison from our lives. So there are some things we must eliminate if we're going to win the race, but we also need to take note of a third element mentioned here. We need to see the endurance, the endurance. Look with me at verse one again. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Not only do we need to run, we need to run with endurance. And the point here is that the Christian life is not a sprint. It is a marathon. It requires hupomone. It requires endurance, which is a steady determinism uh, and determination to keep going no matter what. It means keep running even when you're tempted to give up or to give in. If you've ever done any running, especially any long distance running, you know that you can get to the place where everything in your body tells you to stop. Your lungs may feel like they're going to explode. Your legs may begin to feel like they're going to stop working. The pain may be enormous, but what do you need to do? Keep pressing on, keep going on. This is really the main message for the original audience of this book. They were in danger of giving up on the Christian faith. They were in danger of succumbing to the pressures of their persecution. And we have to be concerned about the same kind of things in our lives. For us, it might just be simply the temptation to grow weary in well-doing and maybe get to the place where, you know, we ought to let somebody else do this. It may be simple fatigue or weariness that may lead us to finding a bed of ease instead of continuing to run the race. And the world that we live in doesn't make this any easier because our world tends toward a focus on leisure and entertainment. And it is so easy to fall into the trap of slowing down in the race or even stopping to run altogether. I mean, I've heard people talk about retirement in terms of, you know, pastor, I'm going to get an RV and see America. Instead of I'm going to find a place of ministry where I can really count for Christ. And listen, you and I cannot stop running the race until we cross the finish line. We will no doubt get older and we'll have to deal with all the limitations that aging brings. But as long as the Lord leaves us here, we have to keep running the race. Well, there's one last thing that we see in this passage of Scripture. There's something that I easily could preach an entire sermon on. But lastly, we see the example. Look at verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The author of Hebrews has painted a 
picture here where there are a wide variety of people who have demonstrated biblical faith. But we saw this in chapter 11. But now he points to the perfect example, the Lord Jesus Christ. We must keep our eyes on Christ if we're going to win the race. In running, as in any sport, where you look is extremely important. Nothing will throw off your stride or cause you to lose your balance and fall quicker than looking down at your feet or looking up in the stands to see who's watching. You can't afford to look back and see if another runner is catching up to you. Why do you think they put blinders on those horses who run those horse races? The point is you have to keep looking straight ahead. You have to keep looking toward the finish line. The Christian race is no different. If you want to win the race, you have to keep your eyes on the finish line, which is Christ himself. I heard about a farmer who was teaching his son how to plow straight rows in the field. And he instructed him to set his eyes on a particular object and then just go straight toward that object. Christ is the object of our faith. He is the source of it, but he's also the perfecter or the completer of it. If we keep our eyes on Christ, we will not be led astray. We will not veer or curve around. We will not stumble and fall. We will not be diverted from our God-given course. And listen, it is easy to fall into the trap of getting our eyes on other people instead of Christ. It's easy to start looking around at who's watching us and what they think of us rather than living to please Christ. Churches can fall into this trap. We can make church about some sort of competition with each other instead of all about Christ and doing his will. I came across this quote this week from a guy named Garrett Kell. He said, it is much harder to look down on the sin of others when you're looking up at Jesus who took your sin on the cross. We're going to be much more forgiving and patient with other people if we keep our eyes on Christ. We're going to be less judgmental when we consider that it is my sin that put Christ on the cross. Keeping our eyes on Christ is really the key to winning the Christian race. But notice what the author of Hebrews says about this. He uses the name Jesus, which emphasizes his humanity, particularly his endurance of pain, humiliation, and disgrace on the cross. He says that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. We've already seen that word author. It's the, the word archegos. It means the source. It can mean pioneer, originator, champion, forerunner, Leader, We saw this earlier in our study. This simply means that Jesus is the source of all genuine biblical faith. But this can also mean he's our chief example. He's the one we look to to learn how to live the Christian life. He is the one we should look to for understanding how to win the race. He is our supreme example. He was tempted just like we are tempted, yet he was without sin. He lived a perfect life of faith. He trusted his heavenly father explicitly throughout his life on earth. So we are to follow his example. He is not only the archegos, the author of our faith, he is also the Teleotes, the completer, the perfecter of our faith. Of course, he 
completed our faith as far as atonement and sacrifice on the cross. And when he shouted, it is finished from the cross, our salvation was fully and perfectly complete. This is why the author of Hebrews says he endured the cross, despising the shame. He did that to perfect or complete our salvation. But he also did it for another reason. It was for the joy that was set before him. He knew where he was headed after the cross. He looked beyond the cross to the crown. I mean, look at it again. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is another reference to Psalm 110.1, his exaltation. He faced the agony of the cross by clinging to the joy of his ultimate exaltation at the right hand of the Father. This is the very same thing that we saw in chapter 11 as the people of faith kept their eyes on the reward. They were able to endure suffering and to stand up under persecution because they kept their ultimate focus on the reward. And listen, there is another aspect of the fact that Christ is the perfecter of our faith. This means that he was not only there at the beginning of your salvation to get you started, but he is also there every step of the way until you cross the finish line. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He is the one who brings our salvation to its ultimate goal, which is our glorification. And so part of the joy that was set before him was the fact that in the cross, he was bringing many sons to glory. And because of that, he'll never let you down. He'll never, ever forsake you. He is there for you every step of the way. Now, what does this mean? It means you can persevere. It means you can endure. It means you can finish the race that he's called you to run in the same way that he endured the cross and despised the shame. So you too can face the pain and suffering that you are experiencing in this fallen world. You too can stand up against trials and testing and adversity with genuine faith. Now, preachers who preach this text often cite the example of Eric Liddell, and rightly so. As you may know from the movie Chariots of Fire, Liddell was from Scotland, and he was described as having wings on his feet. He was very, very fast. But he had trained for years for the shorter races, the sprints. And yet in the 1924 Olympics, as you know, he refused to run his main event because it was scheduled on Sunday and Liddell was a committed Christian who believed he should honor the Lord's day and not race on Sunday. Well, as it turned out, he went on to qualify later in the week for two events, longer events that he had never trained for. And he ended up setting world records in both events. But that is not where he exemplifies Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It was after the Olympics when he left everything behind, all the fame and accolades of the world to become an unknown missionary in China. And he spent 
many, many years proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Christ. And at the end of his faithful life for Christ, he finally crossed the finish line in a Chinese prison. When he died, his eyes were still firmly fixed on Christ. That is how we are to run the race. What about you this morning? Are your eyes fixed on Christ? Are you laying aside those things that are gonna hinder you, that are gonna keep you from running well? Are you running in such a way that you will honor Christ and win the race? That's the goal. That's the objective, is to run the race and to run it well. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning and help us to understand the biblical application that you have for us in this passage. Lord, help us to not be content with just getting by, but that we would be in the race for the long term, that we would run and run well, that we would lay aside what we need to lay aside in order to be effective and run well. And Lord, we pray that you would help us with this. We know we don't run in our own strength, that you also supply the strength that we need, but help us to have the faith in you that it takes to win the race, to cross the finish line, standing firm in you, having our eyes fixed on Christ and going into that realm of glory, knowing that we have run and that we have run well. Help us to respond to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, what do you need to do in response this morning? First of all, if you're here today, you've never received Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the starting place. You're not even in the race until you do that. That's the starting place. Put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Receive his free gift of eternal life by his grace, totally unmerited because of faith in him. That's the gospel. But maybe as likely the case, all of us, most of us here are believers. The question we need to ask is how well are we running? What are we doing? What do we need to deal with in our own lives? What do we need to let go of, lay aside that's hindering us from running well? And will we do that? That's the question. We, as we do every Sunday, we'll have some men here at the altar area. When we dismiss some of our elders, they're here to help you. Uh, so you'll come and talk to one of them if there's something you need to do this morning. Maybe you need to be baptized like Thomas and Ellen. Uh, maybe you've trusted Christ, but you, you haven't uh, followed the Lord in biblical baptism, and you need to take that next step. And uh, maybe you need to be a part of this church officially uh, and be a part of what God's doing here in this place. And whatever it is you need to do, let's Let's do that this morning and let's respond to his word. Well, I encourage you to come back tonight. I think things are melting out there, so the road should be okay. Uh, you shouldn't slip and fall. Um, and I hope that you'll make uh, the effort to come back tonight. We're going through 1 Corinthians and uh, we're going to continue with that study tonight. And it's some very practical stuff, so I encourage you to, to come and be back with us for that study. Well, let's stay.